Hello, I'm Doug Packer, and I'm pleased to be here with you. It's good to see you again. Oh, I guess I can't see you, but uh, you can see me. I'm going to be uh, presenting the Eric Prostowski Lectureship uh, Award. I'm very appreciative to both uh, HRS and especially to Eric. Anything that has his name on it, <clears throat> I'm for it, and uh, look forward to going through the Cabana trial and see what lessons that we've learned over the course of the last year or two and uh, what's happened since the late breaking clinical trial. Now, before we do that, we have to uh, go through some disclosures. These you can look at when you're on uh, the website. Um, they are uh, advisory boards, they're research funding, and they're also intellectual property. Now, when we first presented Cabana at the HRS meetings, there were some bloggers that were a little bit concerned about this. There were some bloggers that had a lot to say, and there were some people who were pro-Cabana, and there were people who weren't pro-Cabana. And I, I think it's a little bit of a jousting match that we had. Um, and you could probably best say it by, my name is Idaho Montoya. You peeled my father prepared to fry. And during the first part of the cabana, uh, you know, bring out, then there was, uh, you know, a fair amount said, uh, positive and negative. Now we're out with uh, multiple publications and it's a lot easier to see what cabana did do and just exactly what it means and uh, has taken care of that kind of uh, background. So the purpose of cabana was to compare ablation to state-of-the-art drug therapy for patients with new onset or undertreated atrial fibrillation. So if you're looking at this clinically, it gives information about going forward, even in patients who've never been treated before. Now the primary endpoint was all-cause mortality, uh, serious strokes, serious bleeding, or a cardiac arrest. And then there are a couple of major secondary endpoints, including mortality, uh, death or cardiovascular hospitalization and information about recurrence of the atrial fibrillation if it happens. So there's 2,204 patients enrolled. Uh, ablation therapy, 1,108. Drug therapy, uh, 1,096. They were from all over the world. You can see on the map where they came from. There's about 120 different sites. If you look at the ablation patients, 90% were ablated, 19% were ablated uh, twice. 9% were not ablated because they either dropped out or there was an issue with their um, enrolling physician team. Um, cost was also an issue in some cases. So complete follow-up was still obtained in 1,000 patients. That's about 90.4%. And we followed patients for over uh, 48 months. If you look at the drug therapy side, it's pretty much the same. There were 1092 patients, rate control in most. There was a crossover, and this is really important. Uh, 301 patients were crossed over to ablative therapy. So complete follow-up just on drug therapy was about 966 or about 88%. If you look at the patients who uh, were in the Cabana trial, you, you can see that about 42% of them were paroxysmal about 47% were uh, persistent and long-standing persistent in 10. And you see that the patients were highly uh, symptomatic. There's a lot more that's available in the uh, different manuscripts that have been published, but I think that that gives you kind of an idea. Now, let's look at the primary and the secondary endpoints. And if you look at the first column and the primary endpoint, again, it's a composite of all these factors. Then it was about 8% event rate. If you looked in the drug therapy patients, it was about 9.2%. If you look in all-cause mortality, it was 5.2% in ablation versus 6.1% in patients who were drug treated. You can see that that suggests that the trial really is pretty neutral. Uh, it was 0.86 from the standpoint of a hazard ratio and uh, we refer to it as really a neutral trial, and I'll tell you why as we go through this. If you look at the KM curve, you can see that there were fewer events in patients who were ablated. There were more events in drug-treated patients, but the hazard ratio was only 
and that did not meet uh, our significant uh, significance endpoints that we wanted. Now, if you look at primary and secondary outcomes, what you just saw was intention to treat, and what you see now is treatment received. So these are the patients that actually were treated. They didn't drop out, they didn't cross over. These were patients that got the therapy. Now this is different because if you look in the ablation group, it's 7% had events, and the drug group, 10.9% had events. In all-cause mortality, 4.4% versus 7.5%. And you see in the hazard ratios that we're talking about uh, a point estimate of 0.67 for the primary endpoint and 0.60 for the all-cause mortality. And so these were highly significant. So if you're looking at patients who had treatment where they actually got it, then that's, that's the slide. <clears throat> if you're looking at a primary endpoint and we're looking at per protocol, then there's an even greater difference. Uh, ablation patients had fewer endpoints, and the patients who were drug treated had more in the way of uh, different events, again, death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest. And here, the relative risk reduction was about 27%. Uh, and I, I think it's always important to take a look at the 95% confidence interval, which here is 0.99, and that was nicely significant. So. There are issues when you try to interpret a trial. If the trial design and execution and you're strict and purist, you go by intention to treat and that's what we said we'd do. Uh, it's kind of the existential approach. If you're looking at data interpretation, then frequently if you're looking at clinicians that have to make decisions about how you treat patients, you look at a little bit more of a pragmatic or practical um, point of view. Um, and that's in the as treated ortho per protocol versus the intention to treat. But we feel fairly strongly in this that these uh, data are explanatory, not just exploratory. And if you look at the primary endpoint subgroup analysis in the per protocol, you can see that in patients under the age of 65, uh, those under the age of 75, minorities, and certainly patients that had class two or three heart failure there was a, a significant shift from the null line over to the ablation better line. So this is the main trial. Ablation did not produce a significant reduction in the primary endpoint and null cause mortality. And that's because of patients that either dropped out or patients that crossed over. And that is what it said here. But the ablation significantly reduced mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization taken together by 17%. And there also was a significant 47% reduction in recurrent atrial fibrillation with ablation compared to drug therapy. 33% risk reduction in the primary endpoint and 40% mortality if you're looking at treatment received and per protocol a little bit more than that. So we believe it suggests that ablation is an acceptable treatment strategy for atrial fibrillation and really has a, a very low adverse event rate. So that's the first trial. So let's talk a little bit more about what we know since then and putting it all together. So AF recurrence, this is a paper that's been submitted and accepted by Gene Poole. You can see that the patients who were uh, ablated had a significantly better freedom from recurrence over time. Drug therapy patients had more of a problem and had more recurrences uh, overall and you get an idea of what the hazard ratio is, and the 95% confidence interval about uh, 0.61. Let's look at quality of life. If you look at quality of life, we use MAFC scoring, or AFEX scoring, and this is a paper that came out from uh, Dan Mark. And if you look at these, you can see that the quality of life issues, or the symptomatic problems were much less in ablated patients, and I've put it here in red to stress the point that it was more of an issue uh, in those patients who were um, treated with drugs. And this went out to 60 months. And that's what is shown here, even by intention to treat analysis. So if you look at MAFC, and you go from three months to six months and all, then ablation was significantly better from the standpoint of quality of life. <clears throat> 
So let's put it together with all of the evidence uh, for age. Now, some of you that are watching this are going to be under the age of 65, and some will be between 65 and 75, and some will be older, and some of you will just look older. So if we look at that, here's the age scores. And this is looking at an interaction p-value for ablation versus drug. If you were under the age of 65 in Cabana, then these are the uh, curves. Uh, there, there were fewer events in ablated patients than in those drug-treated patients. Hazard ratio 0.53. Between 65 and 70 years, hazard ratio 0.83. These come together at about 48 months. And then if you're over the age of 75, then there really wasn't a difference at the 24 months. And then what happened is there was a change, um, you know, more as crossover. So that there are more events in the patients who underwent ablation. And the hazard ratio is 1.48 compared to those who were uh, drug treated. And if you look down here, the interaction p-value for ablation and drug is about 0 0.07, um, which is you know, reasonable to uh, look at considering the three different age groups. And in, in many cases, not a lot of difference, but certainly some once you hit 75. It didn't mean that you wouldn't benefit from the standpoint of reducing the occurrence of atrial fibrillation. It's really more of the primary and secondary endpoint. And so we switched to this slide, and you can see less than 65, 65 to 75, and greater than 75. And you can see that there is a substantial difference in recurrence. Many, many more in drug-treated patients, um, more even in 65 to 75, and more in greater than 75 years of age. Now there you can see that the interactive p-value is 0.45. So let's put it all together with AF type. Now, if you go down here and look at the ablation therapy, 470 were, were paroxysmal, 524 were persistent, and 114 were longstanding persistent. There's a little bit of difference there in the drug therapy group, but uh, it's really crossovers going over into those uh, who uh, underwent a secondary ablation. And again, the follow-up is about 48 months. If you look at paroxysmal persistent or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation in terms of recurrence, and this is a competing risk analysis, then ablation patients did better than did drug patients across the board, uh, even in patients who had long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. So this is new. And so this is something that comes up in uh, you taking care of patients because, you know, before you'd say, well, the persistence are not going to do as well and the long-standing persistence are not going to do well at all. It turns out that it was fairly equivalent in persistence and paroxysmals, but less so in long-standing persistence until you got out to 48 to 60 months and pay, uh, the, the, the two lines came together. Again, interaction p-value is what you'd expect here, about 0.57. Now, if you take a look down here, uh, this is the slide that I use to try to make this as confusing as possible. Not. Here we've got ablation patients. Here's the paroxysmal patients, persistent and long-standing persistence. And here's what it was at last follow-up. So it turned out that if you're looking at a test kind of data, or if you're looking at um, how many patients actually improved or there was a reduction in the occurrence of uh, atrial fibrillation or elimination, that was about 64%. If you look over at drug-treated patients, it was only 48%. So th those are the patients that showed um, elimination or regression, um, truly regression, but not quite the point of elimination 11% versus 10%, no difference. And then if you look at the AF progression, there were only 7% that showed that progression in the ablation patients. And there were 13%, which is significantly greater in the patients who are drug treated. So let's put it together with heart failure. So this is all cause mortality. It's our primary endpoint. It's the intention to treat and it's the impact of heart failure. 
And here you can see that there were fewer events in the patients who had heart failure. If they were ablated, if they were treated with drug, those patients had a significantly increased prevalence of um, you know, primary endpoints and then total mortality. The hazard ratio is 0.64 and the 95% uh, confidence intervals 0.99. If you look at the recurrences, again, the ablation patients had fewer. Those patients with um, drug therapy had uh, more uh, recurrences and a drop down. Again, the hazard ratios are what you're starting to see. This is even with intention to treat. And so the, the neutral aspect of this from the original uh, study is kind of melting away as you look at uh, important uh, you know, secondary uh, endpoints and as you're looking at even primary with uh, different risk groups, different uh, treatment groups. Now, if you look at the heart failure patients, there are a number more who had recurrent atrial fibrillation in the blue bars and fewer that had recurrent atrial fibrillation in the red bars. Um, in those with no heart failure, um, not quite as many patients had recurrences, and it, it turns out that this was baseline. And so you see that even with drug treatment, there was a reduction in the no heart failure patients and the heart failure patients, but the patients who were ablated still did better either way. So what about minorities? If you look at minorities, then this is actually fairly intriguing because there's a, a big difference between ablated patients and drug therapy patients uh, over time. A hazard ratio of 0.33 and a confidence interval of 0.78. So this is, uh, I think, quite significant in part because of the prevalence of other underlying uh, disease. This is a, a paper that uh, Kevin Thomas is uh, putting out. Now, if you look at this for minority and non-minority, so in the drug arm of minority patients, you can see a lot of uh, events. If you look at ablation in minorities, much fewer. And then if you look at drug non-minority versus ablation uh, minority, then there's a, then there's a, a you know, very little difference there uh, between the two. Now, so that is the map. And we had multiple um, patients enrolled in Europe and in Russia and in uh, the Southeast Asia region and also in the United States. So would you expect there to be a difference between Europe and elsewhere? Well, if you look at four-year KM event rates and 95% confidence intervals and you simply come down, with the primary composite endpoint. In North America, there were 10.6% with that endpoint. In Europe, significantly fewer. If you look at all-cause mortality, it's 6.4% versus 2.7% in ablation-treated patients. Death or cardiovascular hospitalization, 61 versus 54. So there was a difference. And so this map kind of comes from that map. And you have North America and South America. Again, the hazard ratio 0.93 and a 95% confidence interval of 1.28. The patients in the US did not do as well as those in Europe, Asia, um, Russia, and Australia, where the hazard ratio of point SMS was 0.51. And it was really neutral. So now here's, a, a situation that is something we still have to tease out. Um, intention to treat was pre-specified, as treated was pre-specified. And in patients that were per protocol, all of those were pre-specified. And the fact that we looked at different uh, areas in the world was also pre-specified. And you can see how these uh, different comparisons were adjusted for the prevalence of underlying disease. So impact of normal sinus rhythm. This takes you back to the days of um, the AFFIRM study. Um, 
this is kind of where these 75 years and up and the 65 years and up remember this well. And we hope that all of the underlings also remember it because it's an important finding. If you look at the occurrence of sinus rhythm versus atrial fibrillation, you can see drug therapy versus ablation therapy. And under drug therapy, there was sinus rhythm about 46%, atrial fibrillation in 54%. But there was sinus rhythm in 67% of ablation patients and 33% uh, in those uh, patients who were ablated that had uh, recurrent and long-standing atrial fibrillation. You can see what the sinus rhythm rates were, uh, you know, compared to the total with antiarrhythmic drugs down around 440. With uh, ablative intervention, there were some that still were on antiarrhythmic drugs, but most of them came off about 25% at the end of the trial were on antiarrhythmic drugs, and there were some who were on rate control. So if you look at sinus rhythm here versus AF ablation, we're looking at a difference of 56% who did well versus 44% who had atrial fibrillation who didn't well, so, do well. So more of the patients uh, in sinus rhythm had a major improvement in outcome than, than did those who um, were treated with drugs and, and still had atrial fibrillation. So in comparison to a firm, patients in sinus rhythm did better than patients who weren't in sinus rhythm. And just looking at this, this is sinus rhythm versus no sinus rhythm. You see the point estimate about 0.42 with a 95% confidence interval of 0.82. The patients who were not in sinus rhythm had more events. That's in ablation patients. Now in drug treated patients, the hazard ratio was still about 0.66 and there still was a difference. So you see the difference between the hazard ratios of ablated patients with and without sinus rhythm and drug treated patients with and without sinus rhythm. Now here we're looking at all-cause mortality. Again, we pre-specified uh, this look. Here's ablation patients and drug-treated patients. And again, the patients who had sinus rhythm did better for all-cause mortality, similar to the primary endpoint. And the patients who uh, did not have sinus rhythm um, had more events. The same thing was true in, in looking at sinus rhythm versus non-sinus rhythm in drug-treated patients. So reverse remodeling. Uh, this is a paper that's out from um, Miriam Rettman. If you look at patients who are ablated versus drug therapy, there was a greater change in left atrial volume index than there was in drug treated patients. And if you look in left atrial volume index and then the different pulmonary veins, there also was a difference. The patients who were ablated had a greater reduction in pulmonary veins and had a greater reduction in left atrial volume index. So that paper should be out uh, shortly uh, in, on paper. So the one thing that we're looking at, there's a couple of things here. Uh, there's AF disease severity and um, looking at that to give us a better endpoint than something that's just a 30% or 30, 30 seconds of atrial fibrillation. Now, if we look at this, there's a difference between uh, all of the patients in all of the terms that I, I just showed you. But what we're doing is we're putting together, and Peter Noseworthy and John Puccini is going to be doing this, looking at pattern of progression, burden, complications, and symptoms and impact of atrial fibrillation. And you can see the components that go into each one, particularly when you get down to the structure. And here are the major endpoints, and here are the quality of life endpoints. Now, the, the point to be made here is that we're going to make a composite score, kind of like a Chaz Vast score, I suppose, where the score is going to be utilized for giving a better sense of how a patient with atrial fibrillation is doing, whether it's with ablation or not, so that we totally get rid of the 30 second endpoint that we've used and we've all hated. Uh, so much. And this gives you the pros and cons of utilizing these different uh, endpoints, and those will be available on the website. 
So if we say, what does Cabana say about ablation? It really confirms prior observational and randomized clinical trials. That's five stars. So five stars, not bad. It's an effective way of eliminating atrial fibrillation, ending recurrences, five stars. It's acceptably safe, four stars. It reduces mortality and cardiovascular hospitalization, three stars. It's effective even in persistent atrial fibrillation, four stars, and it's highly effective as first line uh, drug therapy, or first line therapy compared to drug therapy. That's five stars, but we, we didn't meet the endpoint. It was neutral in the primary endpoint and that first secondary, but it remained substantially uh, importantly uh, significant in those patients who were looked at per treatment and also in per protocol or as treated per protocol. And uh, it's something that as we've gone through more and more of the data that we're finding that the neutral in many cases edges over towards the uh, ablation is good for you side. Now what that means is we're gonna have to change, we're gonna have to change the um, endpoints um, and the recommendations in catheter ablation. Um, if you look at symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, that's kind of always been a 1A, but we think that persistent atrial fibrillation will be a 1A or B. The other thing that changes is used for first line therapy where it'll shift to uh, 1A based on Cabana and, and probably East, but we'll have to wait for those outcome. And then if you look at patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, then that will likely become a 2A or a 2B. So I think we'll end this with the situation that was out there when we first presented the late-breaking clinical uh, trial and what the bloggers and the tweeting tweeters were doing and where we are right now. It's been a change in time. Back in 1998, we'd say, don't get in a car with strangers, okay? 2008, don't meet people from the internet alone, except for me giving this talk. And then 2018 in Uber, order yourself a stranger from the internet and get into the car alone. Things change, and I think things are a lot more clear cut with Cabana now than they were previously. So that gives you a sense of the Cabana trial, what we've learned, uh, where it's important for um, treating patients, uh, where there are questions, and uh, those will be coming out and answered in a number of different trials. Now, it's a little bit hard for you to go down to chat and start clicking to give me questions, but you can still go to chat and then later on, we'll have a session where all of this is put together and we can answer those questions. That'll be announced through HRS. So in the meantime, uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, thanks for letting me see, no, I guess you see me, but I don't see you. But I know you're out there and uh, we appreciate it. We appreciate uh, the work that HRS has done to go through and get this information out, even though we didn't have the big time trial. So thanks, be watching for the uh, chat rooms, uh, be watching for the uh, question and answer sessions, and uh, we'll go from there. So thank you.